pews, our programs, our schools are filled with what I call the ungospel. The ungospel are those in our congregation, those in our faith community who are outside the experience of the good news. That the good news of Jesus isn't real for them. They may have heard it cognitively, but it has not moved their hearts. That they haven't experienced the joy, the peace, the courage, the mercy, the forgiveness, um, the welcome and hospitality of the good news. And so the unchurched or the ungospel, I think, are sitting in our pews. You have kids in your program as young as 10 who are already starting to think about checking out because it doesn't feel real to me. Do you see the importance of what Pope Francis talks about when he talks about the value, the, uh, the imperative to encounter? An encounter is a genuine experience of Jesus and the good news. And so, so it, it's a way for me to start to understand what's going on here with, with the younger ages here. And it helps me understand the almost does. And if I think about it, now this would have to be a candy will quote me on this, and I'm just making this one up. I wonder sometimes if the difference, why, why do we stay in the church in the midst of all this chaos? So some people leave, we're still here. And maybe, and maybe it's because we indeed have had an encounter, and we know that our faith community is part of the way that encounter happens. That's fascinating. That's really, that's a very good insect thought. <laughs> wow, I'm pretty excited with myself right now. Do, do you see the implications? I mean, you're, there's, there's broader implications here. Yeah, I, I need to think that through. That, that's really pretty interesting. All right, so here's the other thing. And we ask them, we ask them, in their words, why did you leave? And this is where the qualitative analysis comes in, where we had to sit down with their, their interviews, with their scripts, uh, with the videotapes, we had to cut and paste and all that. So here's what I ask you to do. Just, just look at this list of reasons why they left, all right? So I'll, I'll come, we'll follow along here. Uh, disagreeing with or don't believe in church teaching, they see it as nonsensical. They don't believe in religion altogether, that there's other paths to meaning and purpose. Uh, they changed the denomination of religion. You heard some of the stats. Family change in affiliation of practice. Don't believe in God. Moral failures of church leadership. That's where the abuse crisis, that's where the abuse issues would come in, right there. No freedom to question or doubt. Express their uh, uncertainties. Uh, drifted away. Church not welcoming. Just take a look at that for a moment and figure out in your mind, what do you think would be in the top three for the young adults that we study? When you think about disaffiliated young adults, what would you put in your top three? And this doesn't affect whether you get what or not. We're going to do our highly unscientific poll, okay? So Hanley said, uh, number one, this disagreeing rules. What, what, why does it show up on all slides? Just, <coughs> you saw it, Tori? Oh, here it comes. It's shock. It was just, how many have number one? Disagree with church, church teaching? How many have that in your top three? Just raise your hand. All right, if you're going to watch, you've got time to look at each other, too, here. How about number two? They don't believe in religion altogether. How many have that in your top three? All right. How about number three? Changing denomination of practice. Oh, a few of us. Number four, family change. Especially see the younger kids. Number five, don't believe in God. Number six is a moral failure of church or church leadership. Quite a few of us. Number seven, no freedom to question, doubt, or discuss. Okay. Number eight, drifted away. Nine, church not welcome. Now, here's, here's what's interesting about this. Uh, they're already in priority order. And, and, here, and here's why I'm saying this to us. I, I, I just want to caution us as pastoral leaders not to interpret their reasons for leaving without asking them their reasons for leaving. Do you, do you get that? That I, I don't want us to assume that we know why they're walking away. Now, and I just want to make it a little harder because, you know, what the heck. Uh, here's the percents. But look at this. When you, when you look at these percents, and, and it doesn't add up to 100% because when you do qualitative analysis, they have overlapping reasons and, and all that. All that comes into play. That is far less important than kind of looking at the spectrum of reasons why young adults have walked away from the church and at what age they walked away. 
So what this points towards for us, and you can see the biggest single one here is about disagreement with some church teaching. It's still 39%. So it's, it's, it's a spectrum. And so what, that, what that's going to say to us as pastoral leaders, it's simply not that simple. There is no, there is no silver bullet here that, that's going to resolve this issue. There's no one thing we can do to, to deal with the disaffiliated because it kind of looks like this. I mean, this is kind of what's going on. You know, it, it's confusing. It's chaotic. Again, welcome to the chaos where the Spirit is speaking to us. So no single reason means no single solution. Do you, you see that? that so we as pastoral leaders, we, we have to be okay with the chaos, and we have to step back and look systemically at the bigger issues here, that that's what's going to be important. One of the things that struck me, and it kind of saddened me a bit, was this one. We asked them, is there anything we can do to have you come back? Can you see the church doing anything to bring you back? 87% say no. Now, um, this is my pastoral minister hat. I'm not sure I believe that. And, and only because I think God's bigger than this. I think God's bigger than stats. I think grace works in strange ways. I have a suspicion uh, Paul would have said, no way I'm becoming part of that group. Well, I think I've struck blind, voices out of the cloud. Yeah, I'm pretty much going to pay attention to that. Yeah, I think I'm going to change my mind. So anyway, but this is their words, and this is what, what they are saying here. And then we answer, where, where do you go? So this is where, and if you look at the first part and then towards the, the last part, 35% uh, are non, 14% agnostic atheists, so that's your 49, 50% become nothing at all. And then the rest are kind of spread out over, over evangelical Christian churches, uh, more formal Protestant denominations, other kinds of religions, uh, that kind of thing. So you see kind of the, the spectrum here, I think it's, it's important to recognize that. Right, but, it, but it just gives you a sense of what you're trying to do. And, and here's what I think. I think, look at this whole Mills thing. And this is the hunger for the whole thing. You know, it, it's all there. They're still looking for something somewhere. I mean, so I think that's an important consideration. All right, so, again, this is quantitative analysis. This is their response. Let's do their words. I think it's really important to hear their stories. And so, setting the stage this way, a Rabbi Sachs says this. He says, Community is the place where they know your name, where they miss you when you're gone. All right, now what does that sound like to you? I'm amazed. I, this is so. This is so funny. Think about it. As there are young adults in here who just turn around and went, who? I say, what? You don't have Netflix. You don't even watch Cheers. That whole idea that the communities that miss them, that know their name, and they miss them when they're gone. So how do we become those kinds of communities that, that really listen to their stories? That we know these people, we know our young adults by name, and, then, and we miss them when they're gone, and they know we miss them when they're gone. And so, so Edward said this, and, and this was one of the more humbling things. We would do these interviews, and I would do these taped interviews, these videotapes, and invariably, they would thank me you know, and, and it was so humbling. I said, you know, I, I should be thanking you. And they go, and they would thank me for listening to their stories. Powerful. It, it's a powerful moment. And so I'm going to invite you to do this. I'm going to invite you to listen to Beatrice's story. And I want to remind us, listen to learn, not listen to respond. And you'll catch in a moment why I'm saying that as you listen to Beatrice. So listen closely. We were brought up Catholic. We moved here, um, and that's when we started going to the Christian church when we came to the United States. My uncle um, became a pastor here, so my family went from being Catholic and they slowly being converted to like moving to the Christian church. My grandma was very religious. My mom didn't really go to church all that much until we came here. Whenever we go to church, I would have to confess to the Father, to this person that I didn't really know. I had to tell him all the bad things that I did as a 10-year-old, which to me was insane. What kind of sins can a 10-year-old be committing? Like lying, little things, and that would make me feel little. I was 
would say about two years ago or so, I just, just my way of thinking just kind of shifted and I just started deleting on my own. I, I believe in a higher power, definitely. Um, but I don't believe in our next religion altogether because I believe it segregates people instead of bringing them together, which is supposed to be. There's a lot of good points of the Bible that you can refer to, but I believe that um, the real meaning of the Bible, if it's the truth, it's been lost in translation. It's just misinterpreted in so many ways. I believe that gay marriage, like, how is that affecting anyone else but the people that are involved in the relationship? Like, it shouldn't matter what other people are doing. It's, if it's a sin, then we all sin differently. And when they start implementing like certain beliefs and they want you to live your life in a certain way, and then you start making decisions that are not making you happy just because you want to fit in that little box. And I realized that that wasn't really what I wanted to do with my life. I believe that there's different paths like if you're going up a mountain, like a different path to the top of the mountain, but it doesn't mean that my path is the right one. It's not leading you to the same place. It's all about bettering yourself and giving back and just being a better person in general. I think that's great. That's what people should do. The higher power lives within you and know, within me, like because we're all one. Nature is part of us, and I feel like when people embrace that, um, they can see really that they don't really need religion. I go hiking a lot. Um, I like to golf a lot. Anything that takes out, like plays outdoors, I really enjoy. You reach this safe stand that you're not going to reach at church. When you leave church, you just like leave feeling judged. You learn to appreciate your life solitude, and I feel like that's really great. You become more connected with yourself. I feel like a lot of people now have a big problem being alone, and if you don't learn to be alone, you're always going to be lonely. I'm more um, happy with myself now. Just take a moment at your table. Uh, what did you hear? Was there a line or something that jumped out at you as you listened to Beatrice's story? As you, as you listen to understand, listen to learn, what kind of caught your attention? Okay, so just take a moment or two at your table. What did you hear? You know, turn to somebody next to you. What did you hear in this story? Let's, can I do this? Let me just get a snapshot of um, some of the things you heard at your table. So what? What caught your imagination? What caught your attention? That you listen to the and The cool thing is, I've met this, I've met these now three, I think three or four times over the last two years. It's just fascinating to figure out what she is today compared to where she was in the video here. But what did you hear? What what was the idea? What caught your attention? Just curious. I mean, just a snapshot. So, so that, that I walk away feeling judged. That, that always that was the first thing that jumped out of me was when she said that. Feeling judged. Please. That she is on this path, but she's not sure that it's the right path. Multiple paths. Multiple paths. And I thought the imagery of, of the climb, when she talked about the multiple paths to the top, she said. What else do you think of place? Trust. She can't trust the translation of what we the jury. Isn't that what isn't that an interesting it was an interesting comment. She believes in the Bible and can change the truth, but the truth has been lost in translation. And I'm thinking, what do I think of? Now, what do I think about that? You know, I'm trying to think about that. And, and here's what I went to. This is so, this is, I saw this recently happen at Talent Evangelist went on the air in an interview and said to his followers, I need $54.6 million for a new jet because my current jet, I have to stop for refueling too often and it gets in the way of doing the Lord's work. So I remember nothing about the Lord had a donkey and help me and refuel that. That's a different question. But then he said, you know, the best of travel is filled with such demons. Okay, well that part's true. It's a flight, that's a good old time. But I'm thinking, if you're a young adult and that's your image of religion, this is the guy preaching the scriptures, 
tears. Do I want to be part of that? I mean, it, it just, I thought, we are sometimes our own worst enemy when that stuff happens. Somebody else, what did you, what did you get? What, please. One thing that impressed me was at the end when she said, I, I am happier with myself now. I have, and I thought, well, that's like peace. That is the spirit of God not present with her, even though yes. she's not being and, able to And in she, fact, because she struggled with the journey, says the journey is important. I mean, if, if this wasn't important, you write it off and move on. Right. But because she struggled with it, anybody here in the other interviews, they struggle with this. That's that's a scene. That, that's a sign of a hunger. That there's a spiritual hunger underneath all this. Please. Uh, the, uh, the religion causes segregation. She picked up on that. She thinks that religion causes separation and segregation is not exclusive. Some people are welcome to some are. We actually have some dioceses, not yours. Thank you very much. There are some dioceses who aren't allowed to sing the Catholic song, All Are Welcome. It's been pointed out that all are not. That's a diocesan policy. You tell me what our our marketing looks like. And you say, you just you just said you have to go to the body because they're not going to the All right, anyway, that was kind of a, all right, that was a soapbox. Sorry, that was not official. I guess it was, it was on camera. We're doing that. All right, well, let's do this. Uh, before I'm going to move to another piece, but I just noticed you've been sitting for an hour. I think it's time to take five minutes to refuel and defuel. And what do you think? You ready? I'm ready. I'm ready to go. So that that questioning and doubting happens within the faith community, not outside the faith community. You, you see the difference? I mean, I think I think that's important. So just hold on to that. I want to break the open a little bit more. That's why I think it's a potential vacation for us. The second one is that we find that that indeed the impact of secular culture um, happens in this way, and it, it affects the way they search for that that hunger for meaning and purpose that there's lots of ways of finding meaning in our, there was a time for many of us in here where religion was the way we created a sense of meaning out of our lives. Well, what we're finding with, with youth and young adults in, in our culture, there's a lot of ways of creating meaning and purpose out of our lives. So that's what you're doing. And religion becomes one option among other options for finding a sense of meaning. And go back to those hundreds for a moment. Religion becomes one way for them to respond to the, the hunger for meaning. The hunger for connection, the hunger for recognition, the hunger for the whole, the hunger for justice. That there's other ways that those hungers are now are now being fed. Here's a, a third example of one of those uh, one of those antecedents, those common denominators. Just like the kids in your head, which I think that's a funny phrase, isn't it? <laughs> the people you're carrying around in your head. That's what they talk about. You'll have a great conversation on the way home, whoever that is in your head, just don't let people catch you. But the whole idea that, that they see themselves as good people, 
And they can do that without religion. Do you, do you see that? So that's what, it's the same hunger. This hunger that they, they're looking for the sense of meaning, sense of justice. They, they want to be good people. They want to be ethical people. And they can do that without religion. So if they saw this ad, if they saw this televangelist looking for the $54.6 million for his plane, yeah, can you see? I, I don't, if, that, if that is religion, I don't need that. I don't need that to be a good person. In fact, I'll be a better person without religion if that's the definition of religion. And, yet, and I, although I'm picking on that guy from Louisiana, and I, I have his, his email address if you'd like to express your own concerns. I'm just kidding. I'm like, <laughs> that would be way too much like stalking. But, but I am concerned about, um, about the image of religion that youth and young adults get when they watch the news. And that's only one example. And uh, I could be really politically incorrect by saying some other things about people and how they use faith and religion. But that's for a different time, different time, different workshop. But you get the idea. We are immersed in this. We're immersed in, in their, their definition, their impression of what religion looks like. I want to give you an exa example of this with Rachel. Rachel is the person who said, fine, you're talking with us and not about us. So listen to Rachel's story. I grew up very Catholic. My family, I call them super Catholics. It's their life. My dad works for the church. I remember my dad praying with us every evening. He was a very good catechist. Through high school, I was like, I have to follow all the rules. I have to be like a perfect person, a good person. My perspective was very black and white. And I knew the right way, and everybody else didn't, who wasn't Catholic. But then when I went to college, things started to change. The people who were in my life weren't all Catholic. And I remember feeling uncomfortable because I didn't know how to relate to non-Catholics. I remember asking my roommate one time, like, I noticed that I'm only hanging out and being friends with Catholics, and you are comfortable with everyone. And she said, I just have so much love to give, and it's about loving other people. It's not about whether they're Catholic or not. You start to question everything, and questioning hadn't been a huge part of my upbringing in my Catholic faith. Questioning was allowed as long as you came back to the conclusion that was given to you in the first place. But now I'm starting to question and realizing that my conclusions were always going back to what I had been given for my youth. That was really scary for me. And during that time, I really lost my faith. I didn't even know if I believed in God anymore. is more Catholic-ish. It's part of my culture. It's how I was raised. And I'm thankful for a lot of it, like especially Catholic social teaching. There's such a wealth of beauty and information in Catholic social teaching about how we can better love one another. A huge part of my spirituality is social justice, and I have maybe more liberal leanings than the things that I find trouble with like being ordained. I think women deserve to follow the call that God has placed in their life as much as anyone else. I'm not interested in a church that divides people. That's what Jesus talked about so much, is unifying people. Instead of changing people so that they can come to the church, let people come to the church and then be transformed by their experience. What did you hear? So take a moment. What did you hear? What did you hear in Rachel's story? Especially when you hold it up against Beatrice. Rachel comes from a whole different background here. What did you hear? What caught your attention in Rachel's story? So just take a moment if you go to your table. What did you hear? And I'll get snapped out of that. 